Hello and welcome to Ethically Speaking, a UCF interdisciplinary series on contemporary moral issues. My name is Steve Kubler and I'm the organizer of this series and I'm Professor of Chemistry and Optics and Founding Associate Director of the Center for Ethics at the University of Central Florida. Ethics is often viewed as deeply personal, immeasurable, and inherently qualitative. But in today's event, Professor James Franklin will take a slightly different look at ethics, showing us how values are essentially quantified in many human activities. Before we introduce Dr. Franklin, I'll take a moment to tell you about this speaker series and how you can participate. Ethically Speaking is organized by the UCF Center for Ethics with my collaborator, Dr. Jonathan Beaver, Associate Professor of Ethics and Digital Culture and Founding Director of the Center for Ethics. We developed Ethically Speaking to promote conversations about challenging issues of our time. We encourage you to visit the center's website at ethicscenter.research.ucf.edu to learn more about our activities and to find out about other speakers in our series. We would also like to hear your feedback and your ideas for future talks in Ethically Speaking. Ethics is increasingly identified as a cornerstone for professional training and development. The importance of ethics at UCF is clear from the long list of partners who co-sponsor this series. All of us in this partnership hope you enjoy the discussions in Ethically Speaking, and we hope it cultivates understanding of how ethics provides frameworks for making better decisions, particularly when there are competing values. Today's presentation is being recorded and links will be posted through the Center for Ethics so you can share it with others. And at the end of his presentation, Dr. Franklin will take questions moderated by Dr. Beaver. You can submit questions using the Q&A box and you can also upvote questions that interest you. Now, our speaker will be introduced by Dr. Mason Cash, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Director of the UCF Cognitive Sciences Graduate Certificate Program. Dr. Cash. Thanks. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Mason Cash, as just said. I'm Associate Professor of Philosophy. I'm originally from New Zealand, but I've been here at UCF since 2003. So I'm here to introduce our speaker today, a fellow at Antibidian, Dr. James Franklin, but he's Australian and I'm a key. Um, he's honorary professor of the in the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of New South Wales in Australia. His research interests he describes as combining the insights of mathematics with the culture of humanistic scholarship. So he's looking at how mathematical concepts like and tools like proof and certainty and objectivity can interact with humanistic understandings of how humans approach knowledge. Um, for his work on ethics, Dr. Franklin's been awarded the Sydney Museum's 2005 Eureka Prize, recognizing individuals and organizations who contribute to science and the understanding of science in Australia. Um, he's also one of, taught the world's first course on professional issues, issues and ethics in mathematics. Um, his research work is on a variety, of, a variety of topics related to this, including the philosophy of mathematics in which he argues for a realist understanding of realist alternative to Platonism and nominalism in mathematics, urging that mathematics is a science of the real world's structural and quantitative aspects. He's written books on the history of ideas, especially the history of evidence and probability, on the history of philosophy in Australia, appropriately titled Corrupting the Youth. Um, his work, work on justice and values, especially in an Australian context, includes the 2007 book, Life to the Full, Rights and social justice in Australia, and a 2006 book entitled Catholic Values in Australian Realities. Dr. Franklin also works in extreme risk theory, looking at the combination of small amounts of data with expert opinion to create reasonable evidence-based estimates of the chances of very rare events, especially those with a large negative consequences. And he also works in the quantification of rights and applied ethics from the perspective of a natural inherent worth of persons, and that's the topic he'd be talking about today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. James Franklin to the Ethically Speaking Interdisciplinary Seminar uh, Speaker Series. Thank you. Many thanks for that introduction and the uh, invitation. And greetings to everyone from here in Sydney, which where it's a very lovely day, the first morning of summer. Now let me share my screen. Here's what I'll talk about. First, ethics, the basics, to explain where to start in ethics. Secondly, is there a role for quantification in ethics? Thirdly, accountancy and the measuring of obligations. Then compensation, calculating expected loss. And qualities in healthcare evaluation. Uh, the acronym means quality adjusted life years. 
Okay. Well, first, the basics of ethics. Let's start from the beginning and explain briefly what is it that ethics is really about and why should you care about it? Why should you be ethical? The basic so ethics, the basic concept in the foundations of ethics is the worth of persons. People really matter. The point of holding a sign saying refugees are human as in the picture is to suggest that some people are not taking the humanity of refugees seriously with the assumption that if they did, they would treat them more morally. Uh, here's a cap, uh, caption of the, for the idea. The explosion of a lifeless galaxy is a firework but the death of a human is a tragedy. The picture of the galaxy leaves you cold if it really is lifeless, but the car crash demands your concern, and not just concern for psychological reasons, but because something tragic really happened. Well, so people should be treated with respect, honesty, charity, etc., because they're humans. They deserve it and are entitled to it. Note that the claim should be treated uh, is about action. It's a claim about action. But the worth of persons, the basis of it, is not about action. It's more basic. So often ethics is thought to be about what to do. It has that aspect, but there are more basic aspects to it, such as the worth of persons. Now, that's not to say that other entities, such as cats or rainforests, mightn't have a degree of worth too, but most of our ethics is about dealing with humans. I was about to say other humans, but we do have duties to ourselves as well. Well, next, not only do people matter, but they matter equally. The equality of persons is very deeply ingrained in our ethics, though it wasn't always so. It's not easy to say where that equality comes from. I recommend Waldron's book, as excellent for delving right into that topic. Now, the worth of persons or the equality of persons isn't itself quantifiable. I don't mean that you shouldn't say, well, the worth of person of an individual is infinite. Maybe that is so. However, the equality of worsens implies quantification in some obvious ways. For example, if a general has two available strategies, equal except that one has more casualties than the other, he ought to choose the one with the least casualties. And just because one casualty is in principle as bad as any other. The, word, the equality of persons implies that. I'm sure you've seen the next thing, one of the most famous things in all philosophy, a trolley problem memes. Here's the original one, you have the opportunity to divert a runaway trolley that's heading towards five people to another track where it will kill only one. Most people agree that you should do that. Note the assumption of equality, which is exactly what makes the five deaths worse than the one death. Well, next, why be ethical? There's fundamentally only one answer to that, because it's ethical. To say that some action harms people is a complete explanation of what's wrong with it and why you shouldn't do it. Of course, unless outweighed by some other harm to other people. There's really no other reason. You might be motivated additionally by the thought that if you're unethical, you might get caught or by a command of God or because ethical behavior makes for an easier society to live in. Nothing wrong with those, but if those reasons didn't apply, it would still be unethical to harm people and compare why believe what's probable? Well, because it's probable. Once you've given the reasons why it's probable that vaccination reduces the risk of COVID, that's all there is to say about why you should believe that proposition. The evidence is the reason for believing it. Likewise, something's being ethical is the reason why you should do it. Uh, now, the usual topics that in discussed in ethics make no mention of anything quantitative. Typically, this is the kind of things you hear talk in ethics about. Well, there's commands, thou shalt not kill, obey the law and so on. Rules, like do unto others as you would have them do to you. 
don't discriminate. There's rights to life, health care, education, and so on. There's duties, care, promise keeping, etc. There's virtues, courage, justice, charity, temperance. There's lifeboat, there's dilemmas like lifeboat dilemmas that are a staple of undergraduate teaching in some places. Like if everyone in the lifeboat can't be saved, who should be thrown out? And there's trolley problems as we saw. Now, prima facie, there's no real role for quantification in any of those. But there is one classical topic in traditional ethics that does very much involve quantification. Classical utilitarianism is one of the main foundational theories in ethics. It says this, that the right action is the one that produces the greatest happiness, the reasonably foreseen greatest happiness of the greatest number. And the cover of a modern edition of John Stuart Mill's classic text shows a balance, rightly calling attention to the quantitative aspects. You need to measure happiness in some units, hedons or something, then add it up over people, then compare the results of different possible actions. Take a moment to think how hard that actually is. What do you actually do? Well, there are many criticisms of utilitarianism. Some are not especially about the quantification, but some are, and in ways that give us some insight into the problems of trying to quantify anything in ethics. Uh, a standard problem for utilitarianism is uh, that you can load all the evils onto a scapegoat and the utilitarian formula doesn't see the injustice of that. There's nothing for, because the utilitarian formula just sees the total happiness, not its distribution, which could be unjust to some. Well, there's nothing quantitative in that kind of objection. However, there are other objections that really focus on the quantification and say, well, the quantification of total goodness of effects is impossible, or if it's possible, it's not really knowable. How do you actually decide uh, on hedons? Do you, do you ask people or what is the units? Where are you going to find the units and count them or measure them as the case may be? And especially difficult is the, the discounting of future or more causally distant effects. Uh, if so, if you're going to discount them, and uh, if you don't discount very future effects, well, they'll, tend, they'll dominate, and which seems a, a wrong answer, because you, especially because you don't know the remote future effects of your activities. If you're going to discard, at what rate? There seem to be no an easy answers to that kind of problem. Uh, having said that, uh, in the next section, I want to talk about a genuine role for quantification in ethics. Well, according to Aristotle, quantification in ethics is found in two areas, uh, distributive justice and compensation. So well, we'll have some examples of both of those in what's upcoming. Uh, distributive justice uh, means justice in sharing out, for example, the profits, uh, the profits of a joint enterprise or welfare payments, and that's a, as opposed to uh, justice in punishing someone guilty of a crime. And compensation means calculating what someone is owed for a loss wrongly sustained from someone's bad or negligent actions. Uh, Aristotle writes this about distributive justice. Uh, I'll just leave you a, a minute's silence to read that. Uh, it's not necessary to get it in detail, but just it's always good to be inspired by the classics. It's about the ratio of how things should be distributed from the common stock. Here he seems to be thinking mainly about the sharing of profits from partnership, which ought to be proportional to the inputs of the partners. Now, as an example of that kind of thing, I'll talk about accountancy as 
computational casuistics, as I call it. Uh, the word casuistics comes from the science or art form, shall we say, of casuistry, which is by, defined to be a resolving of specific cases of conscience, duty, or conduct uh, through interpretation of ethical principles or religious doctrine. So it means, as we now say, applied ethics rather than ethical principles. It was a very big thing in religious circles centuries ago, especially Catholic ones, and it's been reinvented in recent decades as applied ethics. Well, accountancy, I mean, ordinary, what's ordinarily talk about accountancy, the kind of thing accountants do, adding up figures and writing a report, what does it actually measure? For example, in deciding if a company is solvent. Well, it's supposed to measure the assets of a company. Well, what kind of thing are assets? What are they? They're not a pile of gold in a vault, typically, but such things as rights and titles, equities, incomings owing minus the liabilities. For example, the cash flow to be expected in the next year from the company's contract to supply so many widgets to Acme Inc. for so many dollars. It's in effect a promise, but a promise that's expected to be fulfilled and that ought to be fulfilled. Well, what sort of entities really are those rights, titles, equities, liabilities, and so on? What is their nature? Well, they're moral entities. They're what ought to be paid, backed up, of course, by the law of contract. For example, the expected future cash flow of a business comes from fulfillment of contracts to buy its product, payments for copyright, and so on. Uh, similarly, what is a debt? Well, it's an obligation to pay. Usually it means pay an exact amount, typically that's been promised earlier. Well, it's a moral obligation before it's a legal obligation. The law backs up the morals and makes sure that the uh, moral obligation has, so to speak, teeth and that it matters in the real world if the moral obligation is not fulfilled. So that's, I think, when you think about accountancy, it really is an example where moral obligations are already quantified, of course, in a especially well-defined area. Uh, well, an application of that, uh, environmental accounting. GDP, gross domestic product, uh, is the usual measure of an economic activity of a company. And it's intended to function as a comprehensive scorecard of a given country's economic health. And it's quite clearly defined and it's easy enough to calculate. You just add up all the paid economic transactions in, uh, in the economy. The problem is as a measure of economic health that, uh, for example, it counts as positive, the cutting down of a valuable forest because there's contracts and money paid to do that but it doesn't see preserving it because there's no contracts and nothing actually is done economically. So GDP is a mismeasure of real economic health in some sense. What it measures is something, but not, it's not exactly economic health. So let's think about how to measure better. There have been many proposals. So for example, you might want to measure the real cost of environmental degradation, past and future. For example, is coal cheap? Well, it depends on how you do the accounting. Uh, it's cheap to dig up and burn, but that doesn't count the real costs in, for example, pollution and contribution to global warming. It, well, it's the same for renewables. If you're going to work out the real cost and do the accounting fairly, you have to work find the cost of manufacture and disposal of solar cells, which is sometimes quite high in terms of the rare materials used. It, all, all that need, um, I need to say about it is that accounting needs to be fair, and to be fair means to regard, um, to count the right things morally, because if you want to know what a, is a cost or a benefit, well, there needs to be a level playing field in the accounting. What counts as a cost 
must be in the light of moral considerations. For example, the rights of future generations who may have to pay some of the costs. And that brings us again to the problem, should their future rights be discounted? The problems are the same as those we saw with utilitarianism. Note carefully, I think that cost benefit in cost benefit analysis is a moral phrase. Cost means bad and benefits means good. There's no way of getting away from that. Right, the next topic is about um, calculating compensation, which as Aristotle says, well, let's see what Aristotle says. Leave you again a, a minute to see what he says. Let's see if you can take on board some of it. About corrective justice, meaning compensating. The talk about geometrical and arithmetical proportion should perhaps be taken with a grain of salt. His point is just that unlike in distributing profits, compensation is a matter of calculating the size of a loss. Uh, before we get to that though, it needs to be emphasized that compensation is one of those areas where the law very closely tracks ethics. I'll talk briefly about the connection in law between duty of, eth duty of care and the connection of ethics with law. The connection was asserted legally by Lord Atkin in one of the most famous British legal cases, Donahue and Stevenson, 1932. The facts are these. In the summer of 1928, May Donahue, a young Scottish woman, went with a friend to a cafe and consumed some of a bottle of ginger beer manufactured by Stevenson. She discovered a decomposed snail in it and became quite ill in the next few days. The case went to the Houders of Lords, which held for Donoghue, entitling her to compensation from the manufacturer, Stevenson, solely on the grounds that she had suffered foreseeable in injury from Stevenson's negligence. Lord Atkin stated the general principle, you must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions, which can, you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbor. That writes an ethical principle into law. A legal must equals, a, a moral must equals a legal must. Well, thus the duty of compensation for loss caused by deliberate fault or negligence is a moral duty, one enforced by law. So how to calculate the amount of compensation owed? Let's take a medieval example. These things have been thought about for a very long time. As in the picture, medieval workplaces were not big on industrial safety. That led to the problem of how to com calculate compensation for loss of limbs, for example, in an industrial accident. Uh, Peter John O'Levy, writing about 1300, says this, if you say that he who lost limbs is now deprived of the mechanisms and occupations from which he could derive profit, then it should be said that either the depriver is required to restore only as much as the probability of profit weighs, or that common custom excuses him from any restitution. The last phrase means that sometimes they go, if it's too hard to calculate, even though it's large, they'll throw up their hands. Well, that's valuable in recognizing that what has to be calculated is an expectation, a probability of an outcome weighted by the disvalue of the outcome. That's still the usual case, with calculating compensation for future losses. Here's a common present day version of much the same problem. There's been extensive legal debate about compensation for economic loss, as it's called. That is, loss of money as opposed to injuries. Should all reasonably foreseeable losses be compensable in law? And if so, how to calculate them? For example, the probability of counterfactuals such as how much a company would probably have paid to shareholders if its auditors have been competent. Plainly, there are some potentially difficult technical issues. Let's take another piece of relatively ancient history. The problem that launched the mathematical theory of probability in the correspondence of Pascal and Fermat in 1654 was not, as you might expect now, anything to do with long run relative frequencies, it was an ethical problem. 
namely, what is the just division of the state in an interrupted game of chance? An example of Aristotle's distributive justice, but perhaps a strange start from a modern perspective. The question had been asked before, but it seemed too vague to quantify. Pascal said, no, a right to a share in the state can be quantified exactly using symmetry arguments. Very inspiring for any work on quantification in ethics. This is a well-known version, I'm sure you've heard of a similar problem, which also involves calculating a just price. What is the fair price to pay now for the right without the obligation to buy 100 shares in Walmart on January the 1st, 2023 at $150 each? given knowledge of the present price, the volatility, and the interest rate. Option pricing had also seemed, after the 1960s, too vague to quantify exactly. But the Black-Scholes equation proved that no, it can be quantified exactly using arbitrage arguments and a partial differential equation, which all shows that quantification of entities that are in the first instance moral is very familiar. Now, qualies and healthcare allocation. This is again an example of Aristotle's distributive justice using calculations. The quality adjusted life year is one year of life gained, say, by a medical procedure, discounted by the degree of pain, suffering, and disability endured during it. So, a quality at level one means you're perfectly healthy. If you're very sick, it's less than that. The plan is to measure the value of potential medical procedures or allocations by the qualities they gain for patients. That will be a measure of deciding on one procedure or allocation over others. So here's a diagram. In the diagram, uh, the horizontal axis is the time into the future. Uh, the vertical axis, axis represents the quality of life, usually supposed to be as perceived by the patient. And the tan colored area represent the gain in qualities of performing the intervention as opposed to the bluish area, which is what it have, how many qualities there'd be without the intervention. Now, obviously, there's something to be said for the idea. It makes a serious effort to allocate resources uh, to do to where they'll do the most good and in a fair way. Naturally, there have been criticisms of the use of qualities. And as with utilitarianism, I'd like to separate those criticisms into ones that are about the detail and ones that complain about the being quantitative in principle. One typical criticism is about the detail is that it may discriminate against the disabled or old who have less qualities to lose and hence count for less in the measure. Is that a bug or a feature? Think about how you'd like to be in different positions in the health system. Another criticism involves measurement problems. Well, who says that a life is only half worth living? Is it the patients or is it people claiming to be experts? If the patients know that decisions on their care might depend on what they say, well, perhaps they might be less than honest and is the measurement consistent? Uh, but other criticisms of qualities object to the very idea of being quantitative in an area like this, and that should be taken seriously as well. Does it make patients just a number? Does the doctor's perspective of doing their best for the patient in front of them conflict with the algorithms of faceless bureaucrats who are withdrawing resources? Or is that an inevitable conflict in healthcare anyway, and some form of qualities are the best that can be done? I don't want to reach a conclusion on those issues. I'm just telling you what they are and that they're typical of the problems you get if you start quantifying things in ethics. Now it's time for some conclusions. I have good news and bad news. First, the good news. There are many areas where quantification of moral entities like rights, benefits, compensation, just distributions is needed and is actually done in 
for current practice. So that's quite an opportunity to combine ethical and mathematical reasoning for those who have abilities in both. Uh, real sciences, sciences are quantified and full of formulas. Uh, and last but not least, they certainly receive more grants. You might compare, let's say, social psychology, which is quite a vague topic, and uh, you might think not naturally quantifiable, but in the field, they publish a lot of papers with P less than 0.05, and they gain a lot of grants. Well, that's the positive. However, I have to tell you that there's a lot of difficulties in trying to do this. What would be natural for me to say next, I think, is that quantification in ethics has got to a certain degree, and let's all get out there and do some more of it and solve all the problems of the world like environmental ethics. Uh, I can't say that, unfortunately. I'd love to say that, I can't say that. First of all, measurement problems are everywhere and they're very hard to resolve how to credibly measure happiness in utilitarianism, how to find units or a measure. And if you found the units or a measure, how to elicit the exact answers in particular cases and how to do the addition or whatever it's needed, how to trade off between totals and distributions, how to measure the worth of endangered species or pristine landscapes in environmental accounting. Well, where do you start? or how to measure the quality of life in qualies. So a natural first thing, and it's certainly possible, is to take a survey of what people value or preference. Uh, and that can lead to biases, but in any case, the chances of getting a consistent measure are slim. Here's an example that people actually tried. For example, if you ask people what they'd pay to preserve tigers, then how much they'd pay to preserve whales and so on. And then you ask them what they do to preserve, what they pay to preserve all endangered species together. It's very unlikely that the latter figure would be the sum of the former. It's just a matter of what's late, uh, re, late, re, recency or something, what they thought of first, what people think about, they value. And what's left at the back of their mind, they value less. So eliciting things from people's preferences is something of a nightmare. And anyway, it's not necessarily about preferences. It's about what's really valuable. Uh, next thing is that waiting rights of distant affected parties is challenging. That's distant in space or time or remoteness of causality. For example, how to wait the rights of distant future generations mightn't even exist, or to present people in distant countries. Now, if you're asking people, it's probably unlikely that you're asking for the preferences of people in uh, countries where it's hard to communicate with them. Uh, people in distant countries or whom the effects of, on whom the effects of our actions are unpredictable. You can ask people for an, what about, are they concerned about the effect of something, but if they don't know that's going to affect them, then they can't very well give a preference. Furthermore, trade-offs of different goods, different kinds of God, goods are unresolvable, or at least almost you don't know where to start on resolving them. For example, improving the environment versus relieving poverty. Well, they're both good things, but sometimes there might be a trade-off. How do you start with determining wh where the trade-off should lie? And the result of all those problems, which are more or less well known, is an inevitable lack of trust in the results of attempted calculations or indexes. For example, some kind of uh, index of e the economy that tries to value things other than uh, GDP. It's always going to be suspected that the makers of those indexes have cooked the books and got the result that supports their own political values. So what to do, what can be done? Well, you tell me. Uh, finally, a, a little suggestions on uh, future, for some more reading on the question. Uh, thanks, that is what I had to say.
Thanks, Dr. Franklin. I really appreciate it. We have some questions in the queue. We're happy to take more. So as we start, uh, everybody, if you've got questions for us, please, you can um, set them in the Q&A window, and I will queue them up to ask Dr. Franklin. Um, we have several questions, and I'm trying to get a sense of the, the landscape, but um, let me just ask you a preliminary question that I had been thinking about as you were speaking, Dr. Franklin, and that was um, your statement that one benefit, potential benefit to quantifying ethics is to get more grants. And I kind of like the, the very practical, like get support to do the work of ethics, which is important work. Um, in, in the areas in which I work in ethics, the grant ethics connection usually comes down to quantification through assessment. And I wondered if you had, from your perspective, any sense of strategies that might be available us, to us to assess or measure differences um, for things we're looking at in, in ethics. I mean, so to be a little more clear, um, when we try to assess ethical decision making or strategies for ethics education, um, that's one way in which we quantify change in ethics. And that is a fundable way of quantifying change. But everybody seems to still be using whatever approach is ready to hand. Um, mm. And so I wonder if you have any advice for us, or are we just simply doomed? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I can't say I have my expertise in gaining grants is uh, very high. So I'm not sure I can tell you that or in evaluating them either. Of course, grants are evaluated in ethics and everywhere else by somebody giving numbers and someone else adding them up, which is always regarded as somewhat dubious, especially since different evaluators may have different uh, expertise, but ne nevertheless be weighted equally. Uh, it, they, uh, there have been a lot of e efforts to try and uh, see if ethics education actually made people measurably more ethical, for example. Uh, well, it's a nice idea to get a grant for. Uh, it's very hard to believe in the results that are going to that are going to come out. So I know typical ones are you give um, eth ethics education on uh, vegetarianism and see if people eat less meat. Uh, <laughs> there are some results, and I'm not sure they're uh, replicable very well. Look, I think the the answer is I don't have uh, I don't have uh, any worthwhile. E advice for that it's uh, worth trying a grant for but in the end I, I i'm certainly not against evaluating ethical things on the basis of intuition for example so i think in the end we should rely on our in ethical intuition so for example it's we rely on our ethical intuition in saying holding that people have equal worth and hence ought, count, ought to count equally if you're counting casualties or counting distribution of welfare or something. Uh, so I think fundamentally we shouldn't, we certainly shouldn't uh, value quantitative measures in ethics for their own sake, as if that's necessarily better than seat of the pants eth uh, intuition. So intu intuition is our basics, but as uh, Pascal and some other people said, sometimes the intuition itself can result in something quantifiable, but you need to be careful. Very good, thank you. Uh, as I'm seeing questions come together in the, the Q&A window here, I'm seeing sort of two, two themes and I'll try to break these up for you. So on the one hand, we've got some broader, what I might call theoretical questions about, about your work in the, in the talk. And then we've got a series of specific, more applied questions. Um, so I'll probably sort of skip back and forth, but I'll try to give, cue you into what those are as we go. Uh, there are two questions, uh, Dr. Franklin, as you might imagine about COVID. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of ask those back to back and maybe you can talk us through a little bit, but um, at least a couple of people have mentioned that they felt torn um, because some people around them have refused to say receive a vaccination or practice safe measures, um, but they're still receiving health care, perhaps at the expense of others who might need it. So one question, um, and this is a big question, and I'm not sure it's directly related to quantification, but the question is, is it ethical then to bypass those who refuse to take vaccinations or precautions and give preference to others? In some sense, there's quantification going on there, but it's a pretty substantial, deeply moral kind of quantification. Yes, uh, I don't 
I don't think the the quantification issues of quantification have any anything to help in that question. So you're quite right that it's a question whether people who have perhaps not done what the right thing for the common good should have lower preference in uh, healthcare and the, the benefits. Uh, look, it's uh, it's a I, and I don't want to decide on that question. Uh, it's an interesting question of casuistry. It's the kind of thing that the old casuists uh, in, their, in, con in confession would have loved to treat at great length. I'm not going to pronounce on it, and I don't think the quantifying anything is going to help. Except, except yeah, I, I'm, uh, on second thoughts, there is, there is a quantification that is going to tell you something about the balance there, uh, namely the quantification of the risk involved. So different countries, as you, as you perhaps know, Australia has had much more severe lockdowns than America, and uh, uh, I'm almost certainly as a result, we've had many fewer COVID deaths. Uh, so those are quantification matters about how much, it's a question of a quantitative matter, what risk somebody who refuses without good reason to be to be vaccinated poses to other people and that's a that's real that's going to feed into how much we, we can allow them their freedom certainly free, certainly freedom is a, a very important value and you you don't want to uh, it's a squash people's perhaps perhaps reasonable conscientious objection but the degree of the quantified degree of risk they pose is very something to be fed into the equation there. That's all I can say about it. No, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and some of these questions are, are um, probably beyond the scope of our expertise, but I think it's <laughs> important to talk through them. Um, yes. As you were answering that one, Dr. Franklin, it made me think that as you were speaking, as you were um, sort of talking through the slide deck, I, I found myself thinking that the quantification approach butts up against the I don't know what I might call the problem of business ethics, right? The idea that there's this whole set of moral values over here, and there's economic value over here, and sometimes there's a there's a push to reduce the former to the latter. That is, one approach to quantification of ethics might be take all the things that matter to us, assign a dollar value to them, and do some calculation. But the answer you just gave about risk assessment is not really about an economic. Um, least common denominator there. So I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about where the economic value fits in this landscape of quantification. Uh, yes, well, we have to examine a bit the notion of economic value. What does that actually mean? What, what is being valued and what is being put in and left out? It's certainly a downside that economic, economic value, uh, it does, it does, I mean, it does, um, measure things that are actually valuable, typically, uh, like assets. But the, is it, the, the question is, does it leave off the, leave off the uh, table and hence ignore other things that are equally valuable or more valuable that uh, we, we also ought to value? And the aim of something like environmental accounting is to at least get on the table and allow some some weight things that are that economic measures might fail to do might, might fail to include. So I don't think we should think of uh, economic and non-economic values as separate or trading off against each other. E exactly, it's more that all values for for a decision you need to get on the table, either quantified or not quantified, but all on the same place with their correct weight, things that are re re relevant, or the quantities that are relevant to that decision. So for, let, let's say, for example, if you're talking about a decision on closing the borders for quarantine, well, there are different things to measure. There's, there's strictly economic value, like what it's going to do to the GDP and uh, trading transactions. And then there's the values of uh, people's health. And you, you need, uh, so, somehow both of those need to be quantified at least approximately before you can get any reasonable uh, trade-off. 
if there if there's a tray, the, the good thing about quantification is that it allows things to get on the table for you to decide on a trade off. It doesn't matter if the, if the, if it's quant if it's accurate or anything. It's just to be there. Thanks. We have um, we have a question from Dr. Cash and Dr. Cash, since you're here with us on video, you're welcome to ask that question if you'd like. Sure. Um, um, my question very much relates to the point you were just making. I was thinking about the Ford Pinto as a ex counterexample to the kind of quantification you were talking about here. And it's often used to talk about the sort of problems of comparing monetary value to value of human lives. Um, that Ford calculated that the Pinto, which exploded with a very slow rear end collision because of a faulty gas tank placement related to the um, exhaust. Ford calculated with $11 part, 11 million vehicles, that's going to cost us $121 million to replace it. But based on the estimate of how many people would die in fiery, die in fiery burning deaths, courts would probably award about $75 million in damages. So Ford made, the, Ford made the economically sensible choice to not replace the part, not recall the vehicle, to just let people die and pay the compensation. And this is being often, often used as a sort of failure to understand how valuable human lives are, that they've sort of quantified them by the reasonable amount of costs that were being paid out in court when somebody dies, calculated based on that, it was cheaper to not replace the part. And people look at this as a sort of inhumane disvaluing of something that should be seen as a different kind of value, the value of a human life, compared to corporate profits being saved by not recalling parts. Um, so should some things just be immune to quantification or made as expensive as legally and humanly possible? to avoid those kinds of what seems like it should be different in kind of values as opposed to difference in amount of values? Well, no, because the, the Ford's, Ford's should have quantified it, but they quantified it wrong. They, and their value is too low based on the, what the court's um, estimates of compensation. They should have valued it, but should have valued it higher. It's not a good idea to say, well, the value of human right in a case like that, it's not good to say that the value of a human life is infinite. So we just count it. We just, it just swamps any other economic value because there has to be allocation of, say, of expensive safety measures. And you have to allocate which ones are going to be, save lives. And as, as we go along, we hope that safety measures become more and more effective. And in, in that case, in, in effect, the estimated value of a human life in safety science is going to become more and more. But given that there's a, a finite number of a finite amount of resources that can be allocated to the prevention of accidents, uh, we do need to have some kind of valuation of where there's going where where that's going to be put most effectively. And in effect, that will mean, even though it's uh, you don't really like to, to do it, put put a monetary value on a human life. It puts a it doesn't strictly say that lives a life is only worth ten million dollars or something. It says that given our necessity to allocate resources, uh, we can we can decide on allocating resources for safety science to those. Um, to those measures that will be most effective in saving lives. And that's a matter we can quantify. Oh, thanks. The Pinto case strikes me, Dr. Franklin, as a really great example of the problem of utilitarianism you mentioned in the talk, namely the, the sort of calculus issue. Uh, this was a, an issue that John Stuart Mill identified very clearly as well. But the idea here is that it sounded like what you were saying was that Ford should have said, oh yes, not only do we need to take into account the potential um, medical costs and lawsuits figures that get us up to that 75 million Dr. Cash mentioned, but also to consider the potential economic fallout of somebody finding out that we made this decision and, 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 and all the future implications and all the economic costs that would have gone into it. And if you had all that data, then you could make the consequential calculus, the, you could do the math, so to speak, and come up with the right thing to do. Mm. But that's a very traditional problem of consequentialism, namely, you can't ever do that math. So is that, is that a sort of limit case of quantification? Yes, I suppose so, yes. So uh, 
like like you say ford should have thought about what happens when uh, can we get away with it and that's that's an estimate of the future effect of their actions i think the valuation of can i get away with it is not something that actually ought to be in your calculation uh, the fact that if if it wouldn't have been a good decision for ford to do that even if it had got away with it that's just not morally morally relevant uh, the, but ha having said that, I, I don't want to be excessively sceptical about the possibility of evaluating future consequences. Uh, uh, where people say in, in utilitarianism, you just you throw up your hands and you say, I just don't know what the future consequences are, are going to be. Uh, we, know, we actually do assume that we have some idea of how effective on average um, where our, our doing, where, I mean, is doing good, is doing a good thing to be expected to have good future consequences or not? On the whole, I would say yes, for the same reason as uh, if, you, if you're playing a, an in, infinite game of uh, throwing coins, heads or tails, uh, what is the expected outcome in the end? It's, it's zero. But if you have a first head, and the head is a win, then the expected value in the future is one. If you're ahead, well, you're, it, as far as it goes, of course, there's a large chance you won't get ahead. But the, the way life works, it does seem that doing good things on the whole has good consequences. And roughly speaking, that somebody who does a big good thing will have a big good consequence, even into the distant future. Uh, we're all fortunate heirs of people sent in the last centuries who did good things and gave us the uh, chance to do have uh, talks and hear them from Australia and so on. Now, uh, let, let's remember that people calculated in the past how to do good, and we are the heirs. Fair enough. Uh, one of our participants, Ben, uh, asked a question that I think is we've answered without naming it. Um, and his question was, how does insurance underwriting fit into this topic? Don't they try to focus on data and not morals? And it seems like we're sort of circling around that answer that insurance underwriting in some sense is that risk forecasting that we were just talking through. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, so insurance underwriting and, and reinsurance, for example. Uh, when, so they're about risk. So in theory, they're not about moral matters, but uh, what nevertheless at the back of them is what counts for people as a, uh, what, to say people undergo a risk, meaning a risk of something bad happening. So it's, it's really harms, so it's something like expected future harms that they're quantifying. And the fact that they manage to stay in business is certainly a positive sign for quantifying that kind of thing. Yeah, so in insurance, yeah, it's. Uh, it's very variable and hard to, quant hard to quantify, hard to estimate in the individual case, the, the kind of thing they quantify, but on average, they obviously do pretty well. Thanks, we, we've, I've sort of um, started us off with a few of what I has, um, have categorized as the applied side of the questions. We had a couple of broader theory driven questions um, one of them uh, coming from a participant named Carlos is about um, the relationship between the ethics quantification and the political project. And Carlos asks, how could the quantification of moral entities be incorporated into a political project, perhaps as part of a project that promotes quantification? So I think the, the interest here is what's the relationship between the ethics and the politics, which again is uh, one of a, a very a set of very old ethics questions. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, well, my knowledge of an ability in politics is nearly zero, so I'm not sure I can help there. But perhaps I could mention that there's, that politics in this area means two different things. There's politics in the sense of democratic politics and uh, out there in the open and deciding who's going to be the next uh, president and who wins in Congress and so on and passes legislation. But then there's also politics in the sense of regulation in uh, internal, um, internal intra-country regulation, like 
the Federal Reserve and what they do about interest rates. But there's a vast number of international regulations as well that affect very much thing, uh, how, how something like accountancy or bank risk works. The uh, re regulations for world account accounting practices, let's say you know, a difficult thing like how to evaluate how to evaluate goodwill of a company, which is very difficult to quantify, and bank risk, how to decide whether banks should set aside uh, capital against uh, various risks. Those are done by uh, groups of gnomes in some international place meeting uh, and deciding on regulations that people outside the industry basically can't understand. But they are, of course, subject to political negotiation but among experts who hopefully are of goodwill and hopefully are not, uh, and hopefully taking into account the uh, moral standing of the general public, but who knows if they are or not. I think that sort of, that aspect of politics needs a lot more consideration. Yeah, thanks for that answer. Uh, part of the work we've been um, sort of setting ourselves up to do at the, the Center for Ethics here is to think about the relationship between ethics on the one hand and the regulatory and compliance infrastructures on the other. And in some sense, there's an ethics politics thing going on there. Um, one way I tend to read that is that the ethicist helps understand the values and their conflicts. And then there's kind of a practical handoff that happens where we say, okay, now that we've understood the landscape and what matters to us morally, somebody else then can implement those in policies and practices. Um, and that tends to be um, the, the ideal, I guess, would be a, a, a reflexivity, like a back and forth, right? That there's an implementation and there's a reevaluation as value conflicts change. And um, so I, I wondered more generally what you thought about the relationship between the ethicist and the policymaker. Um, uh, and I yeah, say this with, with some um, self concern as a philosopher uh, working in ethics. Like, what's my role at an institution that is primarily focused on practices and outcomes? Yeah. So, if you're, so I, I certainly agree that uh, panels of regulatory bodies should have some ethical advice. And sometimes they actually do. The ethicist does have an obligation to bone up on a lot of the technicalities so that when they get to the policy decision making body, they can talk to those people with adequate knowledge. And for the ethicist, in many cases, say, say if you're talking about bank risk or something, uh, do, do the regulations about bank risk adequately take into account the, um, the, the general publics or let's say uh, developing company, countries perspective, which weren't really on the, board, on, on the table in the original negotiations. Uh, the ethicist should say that, but the ethicist needs to have a good understanding of the quantitative things and the perspective going on. That's going to be a lot of hard work. That makes sense. It, it feels to me like we've li we live in a landscape now where interdisciplinary perspectives on ethical questions are really important, um, whether that's on the quantification side or the technology interface side or the policy side. So, so thank you for that. Um, we have two, two other, at least two other sort of theory-driven questions. And one, um, Dr. Kibler, if you're still there, I wondered if you wanted to ask the question about uh, can we quantify the ethics of quantifying ethics poorly? I thought that was a really great question, but I don't want to get it wrong. Well, I can try. I, I, I think what I had in mind is that you, you set out a case very strongly and convincingly for um, why we do end up uh, quantifying ethics. And doing it well then means that we have to have accurate information. Um, and that's not going to be always possible. The ability to predict the future is, is not perfect. But there's also issues of uh, voice of stakeholders in society. Um, and, and so um, the onus is on policymakers in, in one example to try to make good policy based on considering the ethics. Um, but they're going to get it wrong if they don't try to uh, think properly about future implications. And they're going to get it wrong if they or we as a society don't try to um, equally empower voices so that stakeholders equally figure into the calculus of decision making. So it seems to me that there's, there's an ethics associated with 
ethical quantification and you know how do we even measure or think about the um, the ethical missteps of doing that ethical quantica- quantification poorly and what is the onus on the ethical quantifier to think those things through to to get the quantification right well that's exactly right and because it's so hard to get right in many cases uh, that's what that's what means that quantification in ethics has so little credibility in some areas so where we look for i look for areas where the uh, going back to pascal's thing about the just division of a stake in an interrupted game of dice where there was a, a symmetry argument that was convincing to everybody about that showed what the answer was but in something like environmental accounting it's very much harder to do that and undoubtedly the ethicists trying to do that trying to quantify things things there has an obligation to work very hard to try and do something convincing and also i guess to uh, admit to people that the answer mightn't be so good at the moment but they do have to uh, push back if somebody says uh, your quantification is a little flaky well you can admit that but at the same time push back and say well your non-quantification is a lot worse because it leaves so much that's in, crucial, ethically crucial, off the table. We have another question about um, the lifeboat ethics scenarios and um, its quantifiability. So uh, this comes from Dr. Cash as well. Uh, Dr. Cash asks, um, if we take it to be the case that um, Keteris Paribus uh, people are of equal value, then isn't this where our lifeboat scenario is a place where the quantitative approach, whose life is more valuable, who deserves a place in the lifeboat, isn't quantification the only way to solve that problem? Uh, uh, it's hard to say in that case whether quantification is going to help. I must say, uh, I think the main thing to learn from those lifeboat dilemma questions, like if there's different people in the lifeboat who's thrown out, is that people very strongly resist doing anything, making a decision in that case, which shows our very deep commitment to the uh, equality of persons. Even if in the end, somebody says, well, maybe older people should go because they have less life to lose. Well, that's a consideration that you, that people don't very much don't like to have to fall back on that. If they do, do they tend to think, well, it's, that's still, leaves the people equal it's just that uh uh well uh, they, they, to say they have less to lose is means that their their standing was equal except that uh, that there was something to just break the tie when it was forced to do it and i'm not I don't wish to decide those questions i wouldn't say that it's a helpful thing to bring quantification into such a a case uh if the captain of the lifeboat gets out his abacus and well that's that's not a good idea it might be better to get out the straws and say who's going to have the short straw yeah, that the, the discussion there on lifeboat scenarios um is has been real over the last two two plus years now of covid in terms of healthcare provisioning so i know a lot of healthcare providers under emergency circumstances have had to make those arbitration triage decisions which are very much like lifeboat scenarios and mm. So I could understand that an emergency physician holding an abacus is probably not a good look. No, that's right. I think in a case like that, I would prefer it to, on the whole, to leave it to the physician in the ward. Uh, yeah, but of course, the, behind that, there's some allocation of resources that might have to use some uh, calculation. Dr. Cash, you, you just mentioned a story from one of your students. If you want to share that, you should feel welcome. Sure, just very briefly, I just finished grading a paper by a student whose Indian grandmother um, refused a place in the hospital because she was elderly and decided that she should leave that place for the younger people with more life to live. And she's, I mean, voluntarily saying, don't treat me, treat these people who are more valuable. Um, so even if the doctors are reluctant to quantify in those ways, often it, is, it does seem to be those kinds of implicit judgments about who has more life to live, who's more valuable, who better deserves a place in the hospital that end up making the call when you have 100 people to treat and 50 places to give treatment in 
we have to be making with some of those calls, and it does seem the quantification does come into those decisions. It would be nice if we could figure out ways to do it well, and I'm, I'd like to hope that the surgeons have some skill in doing that well, but maybe this is a place where some explicit quantification could actually help people do it better if it's going to make a difference in some cases, which it does seem to be used. It, 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 it could be. Uh, I certainly admire someone who says, I've got little life to live. I'll leave the resources to the younger people. I wouldn't say that they'd said my that my life is not is less worth living. That's not what the implication is. The implication is that there's just somebody else who can gain more value from the medical intervention. Uh, again, uh, I think that quantification itself should, should should not be done at that last moment. But back back of house, if somebody is facing allocation of uh, resources, I think probably they will have to fall back on some kind of quantification. One more question for me. This is, this way, doing that quantification well matters, if it is going to be used. Yes, that's right. Having some advice about how to do it well as opposed to clumsily seems like it would be useful to have. Not that I'm advocating using no, it in these right. cases, but since it does often get used, we should think about how to do it well. Yeah, that's right. Agreed. I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you, um, you a few times used some examples of sort of calculated environmental value or environmental risk. Uh, and it got me thinking about a, a series of news articles I keep seeing on um, accusations of greenwashing of big uh, recycling corporations. And the idea is these corporations came, came to exist and do the work they do um, driven by consumer need or desire to recycle more broadly than their communities would allow. And yet, little by little, those corporations have kind of become scapegoats for larger corporations who say, oh yeah, we bought into X and Y Recycling Corporation. And, and, um, and so there's a little bit of greenwashing going on. And what's happening there is that we're, I think, corporation is saying we're giving so, there's a quantification happening. So a major corporation is saying we're giving such, so many dollars or such percentage of our profit margin over to this recycling corporation, and they in turn are doing something with our energy. But on a larger, the critique is, I guess, on a larger life cycle assessment, the energy impact or the environmental um, uh, risk management is, is just not large enough. And so there's a sense in which quantification can lead to something like greenwashing. Um, yeah. And I wondered if, if this had been on your radar at all, or if it's a concern you thought through. Well, it, it hasn't, but when you put it like that, it's certainly true that greenwashing is a great opportunity, uh, sort of wide open opportunity for people to misuse quantification and pick the measure that is going to make them look good and perhaps then target that measure without doing something that's uh, actually valuable for the environment. Uh, that's absolutely right. But then on the other hand, somebody has to have the skills to figure out where they've got it wrong. So in effect, somebody with statistical skills has to find how the measure is actually working and is, is the measure in aligned to what it's supposed to be ethically measuring. Plenty of work there. That makes sense. So quantification to combat uh, misuse of quantification. Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, we could probably use some of that in uh, evaluating um, citation counting and so on in the academic world as well. There's, it's very easy to miscount things uh, and increase your H index and every other thing. Uh, somebody needs to have some expertise to see what's wrong. I read a figure that 400,000 academic articles per year are published in fake journals. Well, this is not, this is not good. Well, if there are other questions from our, our participants, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we have one more that uh, is a little bit of a circling back now, but there's a, a question from an attendee about your opinion, Dr. Franklin, on the death penalty in terms of ethics and value. And it kind of relates, I think, to Dr. Cash's example um, of sort of this voluntary uh, refusal of service of a, an older COVID-19 patient. So I wondered if you'd, if you'd thought or written anything or if you'd want to respond to that question about the death penalty. 
uh, well, coming from a country that doesn't have the death penalty and hasn't since 1967, I, I have to say I find countries that with the death penalty uh, shocking. And it's, it's the, the value of human life is, is too much to risk it for those who, ha who may not have uh, actually committed the crime, for one thing. But even without that, I think it's uh, not the correct um, response to, uh, to any crime. Now, I, there are some ex emergency situations like a city under siege where I might con consider that uh, execution of a traitor is essential for the survival of the city. But in the normal case, I think uh, that shouldn't be so. But uh, that's, that's just my view. Uh, I'm sure those who come from a country that which in some states have uh, capital punishment are more informed on the matter than I am. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. We have uh, made it through a, a long list of questions, both on the applied side and the theoretic side. <laughs> Um, and it's been really, really good to talk with you this evening. Thank you. Many thanks. Many thanks to the, the audience for those uh, searching questions. I'll turn things back over to Dr. Cuba. Well, thank you, Dr. Franklin, for sharing your insights on how ethics is quantified. Thank you, Dr. Beaver, for moderating the Q&A session. And thank you, participants, for your outstanding questions. A link to this presentation will be made available on the UCF Center for Ethics website so you can view the recording again and share it with others. And there you'll also find links to past talks and information on upcoming presentations in Ethically Speaking. I hope you'll plan now to join us for our next event in which we consider the ethics of drones in defense and combat. Drones make it possible to project power and take life with the press of a button even when commanders are separated from a target halfway around the world. But the ethical implications are compounded by the rise of artificial intelligence, which could enable drones to operate at various levels of autonomy. Everyone should participate in discussions of how powers like drones are used, but our forum recognizes the value of grounding discussions with lived experience. To that end, Major Joshua Lehman will lead our next event in which we explore the ethics of drone warfare and the rise of AI. Major Lehman teaches philosophy and English at the United States Military Academy at West Point, and he specializes in just war theory. But Major Lehman is also a special forces officer who served throughout the Middle East, including serving as a drone strike commander. His presentation will be in person on the UCF campus, recorded and streamed live and remote attendees can visit the Center for Ethics website in the new year to register. Ethically Speaking is made possible by generous support from the many UCF colleges, departments, and units that you see listed here. And I'd like to thank these partners and many individuals in those units who helped bring this series to you. Lastly, thank you for your participation, and we hope you'll join us for future presentations in Ethically Speaking. <laughs>